That's kind of conversation between the soul. That's conversation between the soul and the night. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your weekly American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner here with my friend and colleague Derek Davis. And Derek, how's everything going with you, man? Uh, good. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, afraid of Chinese weapons raining down uh, undetected from above now. But uh, yeah, well, we've both okay. been suffering from Havana syndrome. So, like, well, if we see, I mean, if you seem a little a given weak at this point, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we've just been, you know, our psychological. <laughs> that's that's uh, weeks ago. Now, now the idea is that there's, uh, you know, random Chinese weapons in orbit uh, waiting to kill us all at any time. So, actually, before we get into the specifics of this, it, it really does raise an interesting question. What do you think is precisely going on with the fact that there seem to be all these kind of phantom uh, problems that members of the deep state have been identifying? Is it just kind of the psychological wages of empire, where if you are um, involved in something that uh, on some level you don't think is just, you're, you're going to kind of develop symptoms, morbid symptoms, as, as I believe Gramsci called them um, in these moments. Do you think that's that's basically what it is? I mean, th that's the only thing that makes sense to me at this point, because nobody has demonstrated that there is a device that exists in the world that can do the things that people are claiming that it does. And this is one of the things that drives me crazy about the Havana syndrome reporting is there's this assumption that this weapon must exist. And the reason that it must exist is because uh, the United States and the Soviet Union researched this kind of thing decades ago. Okay. I mean, it doesn't mean they actually succeeded in, in developing a weapon. Um, and, you know, so I just kind of sit here and marvel at the way we've just elided the question of whether this thing actually exists. And we assume that it does. Um, the only thing at this point, absent proof of, of the existence of such a weapon that makes sense to me is that, uh, you know, somebody had a, a you know, a few people had a bad day or there was a bug going around or something and they said you know i feel sick uh we don't understand some of the symptoms i get that we don't understand some of the symptoms or the effects that they've experienced but then it just kind of caught on and now you have uh this kind of condition uh going around like wildfire that people are just latching on to and and I, I think some of it may very well be the sort of psychological wages of empire i don't i don't know i mean i don't i'm, I'm trying not to to pronounce anything because i think that's what the uh i, I want to say people who re have reported this story in many ways it's people who have manufactured or are like really trying to will this into existence it seems like um you know that that to me is is their failure and i don't want to i mean i don't want to duplicate that failure but i don't know what else it could be Right, and we we of course can't can't exactly know uh, whether it, whether it is the psychological wages of empire, but it does seem to be, and and maybe this is just a feature of modernity, because I think you get you know um, diagnoses of hysteria in the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries and things like that. But Ross Douthat just published a book about chronic Lyme, um, where he essentially investigates whether or not this is a real thing and whether or not he has it. And, and I think it's kind of interesting as a social phenomenon that we're seeing across occupation categories effectively the um, the diagnosis kind of the self-diagnosis of these long-term conditions that that don't seem to have much scientific backing, which to me suggests, to borrow from friend of the pod Jordan Peterson, some sort of Jungian collective unconscious <laughs> thing happening right now with uh, the, the sort of decline of the empire, the, the fact that people don't really believe in things, the fact that there seems to be a disconnect between the structures that define American politics and the effect that people are actually able to have on politics themselves. And it, it would be a surprise if that sort of this in in this usually transformative moment that doesn't have some sort of effect on how people literally feel you know mind and body are connected and so it'd be shocking if if this wasn't the case uh yeah i mean i i you know and it's not even necessarily like uh you know i've seen people call it uh mass psychosis i don't think that's the right way to think of it i think it's um you know you get a, a pop a media pop because a few people in one facility have said we you know we have these particular symptoms and then people read that and they're experiencing something similar and they say wow you know uh 
I think I have this. And it gets, you know, it's, it's just self-diagnosis. I don't know that it's, um, you know, a kind of mass phenomenon so much as it's like a game of telephone. It kind of goes on and on and on and people uh, latch onto it to, to explain the way that they're feeling. So speaking of that, what's going on with China and the hypersonic weapon? Is that what people are talking about these days? Uh, yeah. So there, um, the, the backstory to this is a couple of weeks ago, the Financial Times uh, published a big scoop uh, <laughs> that said, and the Chinese, I should say the Chinese government denied this um, in the immediate uh, aftermath of it, but they published a big scoop that China had tested a particular type of hypersonic glide vehicle. Uh, which could be used to deliver a nuclear payload. Uh, th the system that they tested appears to have been what's called a fractional orbital bombardment system, or FOBs, uh, in combination with the hypersonic glide vehicle, which is a particular type of um, delivery device. So it's a, a the the way to think about this is like you have a couple of different ways to get a nuclear weapon to the target if the target is you know continents away one of them is the intercontinental ballistic missile old favorite friend of the pod icbm um, yeah right and but there are these gliders that you can fly low in the atmosphere um they can evade missile defenses that are set up to detect kind of high arc trajectory missiles uh, and come in below uh, a missile defense system. Uh, the FOBs is not a particular weapons platform. It's a it's a tactic for getting these payloads to the other side of the Earth um, that relies on launching them into a low Earth orbit uh, and then sending them kind of around the Earth to attack uh, from you know from typically behind the, the, other the trajectory side. is yeah. sort of like if if Russia or China were to launch nukes at the United States, they'd do it over the Arctic. Uh, in this case, with the FOBs, you can kind of have this thing go around the Earth a couple of times, attack from a direction that maybe uh, right. your enemy isn't expecting. And so, and, when China decides to destroy all of humanity, this is what right, we'll be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this yes, is what we'll be looking at. Do, as we all know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so the the test apparently used one of these hypersonic glide vehicles in combination with a FOBs. Uh, style of, uh, you know, attack or, or tactic. Uh, and this is, you know, what is supposedly so scary uh, that it caused the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, in an interview uh, with Bloomberg uh, that, that uh, was uh, broadcast yesterday on Wednesday, uh, to say that it was very concerning, this test was very concerning, and to say it was very close to a quote-unquote Sputnik moment. So here, let me put on my Cold War historian's hat. So people <laughs> who don't know about this, uh, in 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, um, a, a satellite that really freaked out everyone in the United States because it seemed like in the uh, early Cold War moment, um, when people were really worried about uh, nuclear annihilation and nuclear war, that the Soviets had surpassed the United States in terms of weapons technology and development. Because actually, people may or may not know, the first research into, into rockets was really um, defined as space research, because the idea being that once you were able to get trajectories in a vacuum that is space, you'd be able to go from good, uh, you'd be able to go from that basic knowledge to doing trajectories with gravity and wind and things along those lines. So, so space research initially was founded as uh, effectively rocket research. And that's true from the very beginning. Um, and we'll probably do a future pod about this, but a lot of um, public private partnership, government defense contractor partnerships going back to the 1920s are, are really related to this whole situation. But I was thinking as an academic, the, the Sputnik thing was the best thing to ever happen to American uh, academia <laughs> because right <laughs> after it in 1958, you get the passing of the National Defense Education Act, which really uh, funds STEM stuff, you know, the natural sciences right. um, first and foremost, but also gives a shit ton of money to things like the humanities and area studies and things along those lines. And this is a recurrent theme we see in American history whereby types of social democratic funding, social democratic efforts are always linked to American militarism. Um, something tells me that we're not going to see a massive reinvestment in American <laughs> university after the so-called Sputnik moment, but it's something well, that, uh, to be aware of. That's because it's not a Sputnik moment. Right. Like, it's, this is such right. a dumb comparison. Like Sputnik, I mean, uh, Sputnik really did, at least to outward appearances, demonstrate that the Soviets – 
had moved past the United States. I mean, the United States hadn't put a satellite in orbit yet. We weren't, you know, uh, to that point in a, in a space program. And it really was like a shocking moment for people. Um, this test uses technology that the United States had decades ago. Like, there's nothing about this test uh, that is new or suggests that China has surpassed the United States somehow. I mean, it's it suggests that China's military capabilities have advanced to some degree, uh, but it it doesn't. It's not like they're beating us in something now, or we need to be worried about this. The use of these two technologies together is supposedly very novel. Uh, nobody's tried this kind of combination of the hypersonic vehicle and the uh, the FOBs technique. Um, but that's because it's it's kind of dumb. Like it's kind of a dumb way to get uh, a payload onto target. It's not efficient. ICBMs are still far and away the uh, the most efficient way. If you really want to, you know, fuck up somebody's day, uh, they're still far and away the most efficient way to do that. Um, there's some fear that China could like put these things in orbit and just leave them there. Uh, and like attack, you know, just kind of set up this uh, first strike capability they could attack uh, at any time without warning. But that would be incredibly risky. I mean, you'd have to maintain these things. Uh, I don't think you could do it in a way that would be undetectable. Um, and, and you'd have to worry about somebody kind of inter interrupting your control over these things and turning them loose on the world without your, uh, you know, without your, your sort of go ahead. And it, it's just a ridiculous scenario. Scenario, but it's one that, you know, apparently uh, keeps people up at night in the U.S. defense establishment. Yeah, um, and but, I think that's directly linked to their interest to try to maintain this threat, I, I, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Absolutely. To, to try and hype up a, a threat from China and, and to uh, offer this pretense that, that we're in a real neck-and-neck um, -neck military uh, rivalry with this country. It's the same same reason that uh, you know, people like Mark Milley and, and others in the defense establishment are constantly sort of overhyping the number of nuclear warheads that China has. You know, demonstrably, they have a fraction of what the U.S. and, and the Russians have. But uh, we're constantly being told, oh, well, they're, they have secret tunnels and they're building more nukes and it's they're, they're hiding them. They're not making them public. Like, there's no evidence to support this. And it would be very hard to, to hide something like that. So uh, this is all part of a, a piece, I think, where we, we overhype the threat from China. Yeah, and I think that's also, you know, people don't realize that uh, a recent study done, I believe in, in 2014, but it's in the, the mid-2010s, basically said that the exchange of about 100 Hiroshima-level bombs, which we are way past that, would essentially cause a global famine. Um, so again, unless people really want to destroy humanity, um, that... Uh, th these no human being is really going to launch these weapons. It would only be launched by e either literally an insane person, which you know might happen, or uh, or a failure. Which is why you know it's so important to get rid of these things because they really do have the um, ability to destroy human civilization. Right. Um, yeah, I, I I would recommend people uh, check out uh, a, a guy named Joshua Pollock. Uh, you can find him on Twitter. Um, he's a non-proliferation expert. Um, and I mean, he broke this down and, and just how absurd the fear of this, uh, this at least alleged fear of this, this weapons test is. Um, I would add one of the other things that makes this absurd is that the explanation for why this is so scary is that China would be able to use this weapon to evade U.S. missile defenses. When, in fact, the United States maintains a missile defense system that may or may not work, by the way. That's that's the first reason this is absurd. <laughs> but we explicitly say, in order to kind of ease the fears of, of the Russians and the Chinese, uh, we explicitly say this defense system is not designed to stop a barrage of nukes from one of those countries. Like, if they really want to mess us up, uh, they can do that. We, we constantly say, this is here, the, our missile defenses are intended for, a, a, like, a rogue state, or if, you know, I don't know, ISIS got an ICBM somehow. Uh, like, that we could shoot down one or two, like, a handful of missiles, North Korea, maybe. Um, but we always explicitly say, you know, don't worry, we're not, we're not building a missile defense that could uh, uh, stop 
a, a yeah, nuclear 40 arsenal nukes, of the size yeah. that China has. And so, you know, what's the what's the concern then? Like, so it can get around. They can already, supposedly at least, get around our nuclear, our missile defenses. So uh, I don't know what the fear is. I think what what the defense establishment wants, whether consciously or not, is they want, you know, the good parts of the Cold War, the enormous spending yeah, on the military exactly. without the bad parts, which is now basically no economic exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States. If they're able to get uh, essentially an imbricated U.S.-China economy plus defense spending, oof, that's the yeah, good that's stuff, the man. Yeah, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. yeah and, and speaking of uh, sweet spots, why don't we take a train um, from China over to the Middle East and talk about friend of the pod, Mohammed bin Salman. What's been going on with him, Derek? Yeah, if you if the Belt and Road Initiative really catches on, you could probably do that someday. <laughs> That'd be cool. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what, one of the interesting things this week has been uh, the signs that uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, best known for having, uh, at this point at least, most infamous for having murdered a, uh, or ordered the murder of a journalist in, in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, is being rehabilitated. I mean, this was always inevitable. Uh, he is, after all, going to be king of Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's gas station to the world. So uh, we weren't going to keep him, you know, kind of uh, frozen out in- indefinitely. But there have been a few signs this week that uh, he's really coming back into, uh, you know, really reestablishing his place in the world. One of those being <laughs> that uh, the Biden administration is moving forward on an arms deal uh, with Saudi Arabia that really uh, puts to bed any notion that they were going to abide by Joe Biden's insistence that the United States would no longer support offensive Saudi military operations. Uh, part of the package includes maintenance for Saudi attack helicopters, which are not really a defensive weapons platform. Um, the administration says it's, it's going ahead with the arms deal to try and buy some leverage with the Saudis to get them to end the war in Yemen, which is you know what, what that uh, kind of uh, limitation was all about. Uh, I guess we'll see. I, I don't. Uh, I'm not optimistic that that's uh, going to happen. Um, one of the other things that's happened this week is the Saudis took a. Uh, well, actually, it was over the weekend. I guess the Saudis announced uh, that they were adopting a net zero emissions pledge. They'll be at net zero uh, emissions by 2060. Uh, if this doesn't sort of eviscerate the notion of net zero as a, as a legitimate concept uh, in climate change, then I don't think anything will. Uh, but it, it's basically, I, I did a rant on this at foreign exchanges. It, it's, uh, as far as I can tell, this is a, an entirely uh, kind of scam. This is basically a scam. It, it is uh, net zero instead of zero emissions. And I know we've had, uh, you know, we've had climate people on the show. I'm not a climate expert myself, but we've had climate people in the show who say, uh, we don't need to get to, we need to get to zero emissions, not net zero. Well, the net zero uh, relies on a combination of maybe reducing carbon emissions somewhat, uh, but m- mostly uh, developing technologies to scrub carbon out of the atmosphere. And so it's basically a license to burn whatever you want now and we'll clean it up later. And My favorite version by- of this is the LA celebrity version. I remember, um, <laughs> I think it was Larry David's wife, I believe her name was Lori, used to like f- fly private, but then purchase, you know, offsets, yeah, carbon offsets. That's good. I want to start doing market. that. Yeah. <laughs> we should start that. We, American Prestige should ban- yeah, brand um, carbon offset. That's where we'll make our real money. Give us, give us, uh, yeah, purchase carbon offsets from us. It'll, it'll be just as good as <laughs> buying them from anywhere else. Um, so, I mean, this is all like, you know, kicking the can, not even kicking the can. I mean, there's, there's no sense that uh, we're actually going to be able to do this. And of course, if we get to 2050 or 2060 and um, the, the places that have, uh, or the countries or the, the companies that have adopted these pledges can't get there, they'll just say, oopsie. Nobody's really going to hold them accountable for that. Uh, yeah, we're really is, just know, putting the pedal to the metal into the brick wall of climate change as a species. Right. There's I mean, just like is, we're just not doing anything about it. It's kind of insane. And this particular pledge, of course, comes you know a few days ahead of the uh, the COP26 summit in Glasgow, the big climate uh, meeting, and MBS is clearly trying to do a little greenwashing uh, of his image. Um, the other thing, which I just read about today, he's got his, uh, his foreign investment initiative, which is an annual thing that, that MBS does, uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's called Davos in the desert. Uh, 
Uh, and awesome. attendance at this thing has been uh, somewhat lean since 2018 uh, when uh, Khashoggi was murdered. Uh, but it turns out that this week, pretty much everybody, all the big wigs, anybody you would expect to go to the actual Yeah, dollars, give it a couple of years. Everyone uh, yeah, forgets about you know, it. Who like, cares about the cold-blooded eh, murder of a journalist? Murder. Yeah. What well, What's interesting about this? Sixty Minutes just did a thing. I, I think it was Sixty Minutes. Maybe it was I, 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 Maybe it was a different program. Uh, with an ex Saudi intelligence officer who, uh, you know, just railed against MBS, called him a psychopath, and had all this these uh, horror stories to tell about him. And and, and yet, you know, that seems to have, uh, you know, kind of landed with a thud. So uh, he's back. Every, he's he's back, and everybody's good graces, and uh, we're all going to let bygones be bygones. Yeah, it's a, a another black mark uh, uh, in the history of U.S. foreign <laughs> relations. Um, so we're going to have a, an interview um, with Alden Young about Sudan, uh, Sudan, an expert on Sudan. But Derek, why don't you just let us know uh, as an intro what's going on there um, these past few weeks? Uh, yeah, so uh, f- ever since uh, the toppling of ex-Sudanese dictator Omar al-Bashir, uh, the which was uh, 2019 uh the country sudan has been run by a very tenuous coalition uh interim government that that includes a lot of military people you know p- the people who overthrew bashir um alongside uh, a handful of civilian representatives a civilian prime minister and cabinet um and they they serve together on this uh what's called the the sovereignty council which runs the sort of uh, uh fulfills the role of head of state in in uh, what is supposed to be a transition uh to civilian government and elections uh in 2023 it was supposed to be in 2023 i don't know uh the civilian and military components of the interim government have not been getting along for some time uh there have been a series of you know, controversies. I don't want to go into them in detail, but uh, most recently there was an attempted coup uh, supposedly uh, undertaken by some uh, friends of Omar al-Bashir or supporters of Omar al-Bashir. Uh, and, and that seems to have caused relationship between the civilian military sides of this government to completely break down. So on Monday... Uh, there was another coup. This time it was not attempted. It was succeed. It was successful. Uh, the the military uh, under Abdel Fattah al Burhan, who was the chairman of the this uh, executive council, uh, overthrew, removed from power the civilian prime minister Abdel Hamdok uh, and his cabinet. Um, this has sparked protests. Uh, a handful of people. Uh, it's hard to get accurate statistics but a handful of people have been killed somewhere somewhere in the um you know anywhere from five to you know who knows how many but uh, uh so several people have been killed uh, there's been a huge outpouring of sort of uh international opposition uh, the world bank the african union african union suspended uh sudan's membership the united states has complained the european union has complained um hamdok was in uh was placed under arrest he's since been kind of put under house arrest uh he's at his home um but basically uh yeah we'll talk about this with alden but the the transition now to uh civilian governments uh seems uh under threat at least to say the least um the the one of the tenets of the transitional charter was supposed to be that the military would uh as things went on, the military would start to step back and, and give more authority to the uh, civilian component. There was a big step that was supposed to happen next year with uh, Burhan ceding the chairmanship of, of the executive committee to a civilian. Um, that That's probably not going to happen now. I mean, cl- th- that seems to have been one of the reasons why they, they uh, did this, uh, you know, was a, an unwillingness to hand power over to the civilians. Uh, so it, it very much remains to be seen kind of how this is going to play out. The protests are ongoing. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know more than that. We'll, we'll discuss it with Alden and, and have to see what happens. Well, uh, on that depressing note, uh, Derek, thank you as always. Uh, and everyone, I hope you enjoy our interview with Alden Young about the Sudan. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. 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 B
Hello, everyone, and welcome to your weekly American Prestige interview. Um, as always, I'm Danny Bessner here with Derek Davison, and we are very excited to welcome Alden Young, who's an assistant professor of African American Studies uh, at UCLA and the author of Transforming Sudan, Decolonization, Economic Development, and State Formation, which was released by uh, Cambridge University Press in 2017. Alden, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm really glad we were able to connect. We're both uh, right now LA boys, so you know we have been going through the strange weather of the of the of the rain and the dry, and it feels like it's all over the place. I'm feeling a bit wacky. I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> we're here to talk about uh, about Sudan and your very important work on it, and also what's been going on in. In, in recent Sudanese politics. So why don't we start at the beginning, assume total ignorance <laughs> about Sudan. So so where where does the nation state of Sudan come from? What is its deep history? What is its relationship to colonialism? And we could go all the way back to the 19th century if you want to start there. I like doing that because I'm a historian, but whatever, whatever you think is best to get people to know, you know, what's really going on here. I mean, of course, there have been, you know, there have been a number of states in Sudan and what is currently Sudan um, f- for millennia. Um, but but in the present, the idea of a united Sudan that looks something like what we consider Sudan to look like, though that's all changed uh, starting in 2011 with what was at the time or may, might, might still be the newest country in the world, South Sudan. The idea of South Sudan and Sudan is a 19th century construction. It was built... The capital of of Sudan, Khartoum, is actually a city founded by the Egyptian armies um, as they came to occupy uh, the territory of Sudan. And at the time, it wasn't Egypt like we think of Egypt today. Uh, Egypt was still part of the Ottoman Empire. And their impetus to expand um, into Equatoria, Africa, was actually driven in large part uh, by colonial competition um, elsewhere. So the Ottomans felt like, you know, they were getting pressured by both the French and and, um, the British and that they needed to create their own African empire if they were going to be able to compete. And so what was the goal of that empire and and how does Sudan fit into that larger imperial project of basically Egypt moving south? You know, the Egyptian province of the Ottoman Empire moving south. What is the goal? What what is what is the imaginary that's uh, beginning to be created? And this is correct me if I'm wrong, it really begins in the early 19th century and it goes basically throughout the entirety of the 19th century with British colonialism beginning in in 1896 if I'm correct. Yeah, 18, 1898 is the official date. 1898, the, my apologies, uh, yes. So the Ottomans um, in Egypt were shocked, right, when uh, Napoleon occupies uh, Egypt at the, you know, in the beginning of the 19th century. And this was a massive, like, psychological shock, right? The idea uh, that Napoleon's army would be able to occupy and defeat, you know, the Mamluk-led armies of the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, totally shook their worldview. And in response, uh, Mehmet Ali or Muhammad Ali uh, is, comes from Albania and actually reorganizes an Ottoman army to reconquer um, Egypt after Napoleon's left. But when he gets there, the major concern is uh, defensive modernization. How, is, how, how to prevent this from ever happening again? And what we don't really re- think about very often is that being a soldier in the Ottoman Empire uh, frequently meant were a special cast of people. You didn't just recruit, you know, ordinary peasants to be soldiers, at least not initially. That would come later. But it was so, so the Egyptian peasantry wasn't seen as a suitable stock from which you were going to make this uh, new army. And they very much modeled it off after the idea of Napoleon's new army. They were going to have a, you know, large standing army. Um, so you had to find people for the standing army. And the obvious source in their imagination were Black Africans, uh, particularly uh, those who contemporary live now in South Sudan. They were seen as very tall. Uh, you know, they were fit for military fighting. They would be distinct as a caste from uh, normal Egyptian society. And so the Sudan was actually conquered initially to create a slave army. Uh, Alden, just a question. So where do these ideas of race come from? I'm familiar as a European and American historian with sort of the North Atlantic world of racial thinking, but where do these ideas of sort of Egyptian slash Ottoman racialized peoples come from? Forgive if that's an ignorant question, but I don't know. 
It's a really important question. It's a hot, it's actually a really hotly debated topic. Um, you know, to what extent uh, ideas about race are kind of global and to what extent ideas about race were always, you know, sort of in Islamic and Mediterranean culture. But a lot of the ideas about race and that will be really important in 19th century Egypt actually come uh, from the military or from, from fighting. Uh, the groups of people that will uh, be uh, bare arms. And so earlier, there had actually been a uh, sort of a competition between people that are called Habisha or Ethiopians and Circassians, um, and which one of those would be uh, the military soldiers. And the Circassians won out, and they became the main military stock in Egypt. People often called the Mamluks. And Egypt would have several different Mamluk dynasties of soldier, uh, soldier, soldier slaves that would govern Egypt. And often they formed part of the nobility. And over time, they became associated with the Turco, um, Turco Egyptian caste of people that would govern Egypt, you know, going throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century and still makes up a large part of the Egyptian elite. But in the pushing out of uh, particularly Ethiopians and Black Africans uh, from that, they were they were the memory of them, but they were pushed further down um, the hierarchy. And so, you know, there's always a constant idea of, of enslaved people coming in uh, to the Ottoman Empire, particularly um, people from the Caucasus and Eastern Europe, but also people coming from Sub-Saharan Africa who were used either as domestic enslaved people or military soldiers. So there's this imagination that certain types of Black Africans are excellent soldiers. And so there's this expansion into what is modern-day Sudan in order to gather an army that would be able to basically push off an encroaching European colonialism into an increasingly weakened Ottoman Empire, which had really dominated, you know, Asia Minor, as it was called in Roman times from the 16th century onward. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. I mean, the source of Ottoman enslaved Ottomans that have been coming from sort of around the Black Sea and from uh, uh, Muhammad Ali himself comes from Albania. That source of slaves and soldiers was drying up and becoming harder uh, to access as the European powers were pushing into it. And so the idea that they could be replaced by Black Africans, uh, particularly Ethiopians and um, and um, Africans from South Sudan or the South, region of South Sudan. Well, I, I would just add to this. These, I mean, there were racialized notions of slaves in the Ottoman Empire. I mean, the the uh, one of the most powerful positions in the Ottoman palace was called the Kizlar Aga, uh, who was the chief of the palace, which um, eventually came to mean basically the guy who ran the harem, uh, where the the wives and the concubines and the princes uh, hung out, and that position was typically filled by an African slave. It was, it, it, it kind of in, uh, informal, <laughs> uh, terminology is known as the chief black, uh, eunuch. Uh, and there was a chief white eunuch who was in charge of kind of gatekeeping, uh, the palace and access to the Sultan. Uh, but the, the chief black eunuch by virtue of the, the sort of growth and importance of the Haram as the, the center of politics in the empire, um, really became one of the most powerful positions in the Ottoman empire by this point, by the time we're talking about. Yeah, no, for sure. And these, and these kind of racial and ethnic roles for enslaved people played out in the imagination of, uh, 19th century Ottoman Egyptians. So um, there's a really unique, at least in, in my um, understanding, uh, sort of this this British Egyptian alliance, this Anglo Egyptian alliance that begins to take shape in the late uh, 19th century. Could you maybe describe how did the British enter the scene, uh, and what what does this alliance look like um, in, in the you know the fin de siècle, the the late 19th, turn of the 20th century? Yeah. So one of the Interesting thing is about uh, Sudan as a colonial project, particularly at the late 19th century, early 20th century, is that it's a condominium. Um, and the condominium is a strained legal structure in which they, 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 they acknowledge two sovereigns. Sudan is the property of both the British and the Egyptian crown. Um, and because of that, it's actually never an official colony of Britain. It's actually run by a corporation. Um, Oh, good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that, that always works out. <laughs> <laughs> and so it has its own uh, service, the Sudan Political Service. Uh, 
and these people are, you know, recruited usually from Britain. Um, but, you know, in the early period, there were also a lot of Egyptians involved. And one of the things that happens is that the Egyptian army is used to reconquer Sudan uh, from the Mahdi or the Mahdiya, uh, which was a, a, an Islamic state that arises in Sudan in the late 19th century. But they use the Egyptian army, but it's, gov- it's, it's led uh, by British officers, particularly Lord Kitchener. And so what is the state of Sudanese politics, let's say, in the early 20th century? Because your book basically focuses on the mid-century period from the 30s to the 60s. So uh, what's the state of Sudanese politics? And then where do we find ourselves in, in the 1930s? And why do you think that's such a crucial moment to begin um, this, this history of Sudan that you, that you wrote? So Sudan, from, 19, from 1898... Until 1956, Sudan is, you know, the Anglo-Egyptian uh, condominium of Sudan. And its sovereignty is a bit, uh, its sovereignty is complicated. But this project kind of works as long as Britain dominates Egypt. Uh, politically, um, it dominates Egypt, it dominates Egypt's foreign affair, foreign policy and things like that. But it was always uneasy. It was always an unclear question of whether or not, you know, if Egypt, if Britain left, would Sudan simply become part of Egypt? And for Egyptian elites in the Egyptian uh, royal family, it was clear that Sudan was part of Egypt. And for Egyptian nationalists, Sudan was an important part of Egypt because it was what made Egypt a civilized nation, uh, a powerful nation, you know, a nation that should be taken seriously in world affairs. The Why is that, that? What does Sudan add to to Egypt? So the idea that Sudan, that Egypt actually had its own colonies or had its own dependencies uh, was very important, you know, in the contest of nations. So the, Egypt wasn't just a regular nation. It was a nation that also, you know, had a significant interest in foreign affairs. But in 1936, Egypt is admitted into the League of Nations. Um, and it's in this process that Egyptian nationalists begin to bring charges against, against the British as they're own, fighting for their own autonomy. So they'll eventually bring it up also in the United Nations. Um, and they say that Britain has mismanaged uh, Sudan and in doing so has damaged Egyptian national interests. And, what they, and they start raising these issues about Britain denying Sudan the ability to develop itself to its full capacity, uh, restricting agricultural production, restricting Egyptian manufactured goods for sale into Sudan, um, restricting Egyptian banks, Egyptian investment. And for me, this logic was still a kind of an inter-colonial dispute, you know, between uh, Britain and Egypt. But Egypt sends uh, financial advisors to Sudan to audit, to attempt to audit what's going on. And in this process, they actually get involved with the budding Sudanese nationalists who are really angry at this time, that they've been completely cut out of discussions of the future of Sudan. Um, Actually, also the Sudanese political service, largely staffed by British people, was was really upset because they also weren't involved. And they saw themselves as a corporate interest detached or, you know, related to British interests, but actually separate. Um, from the foreign office. Right, which is a, it's something that goes deep into British history, having these sorts of colonial charters that allow companies to essentially uh, be semi-sovereign entities, like the British East India Company is mm. probably the most famous, or the Hudson Bay Company in Canada. This is something that goes deep into British history that, that goes into the 20th century here. But it's in that context of contestation that uh, Sudanese nationalists also pick up a lot of the rhetoric of, you know, that Britain has been underdeveloping Sudan. In particular, Britain's been restricting our ability to irrigate, to use the Nile waters, uh, to expand our irrigation, to fully maximize our exports of cotton. Mm, It's restricting our trade with our neighbors, so it's restricting our trade with Egypt, but also restricting our trade with uh, the newly independent, uh, or the new country of Saudi Arabia across the Red Sea. And so, this becomes a kind of core of nationalist uh, demands for, and the economic sense for what uh, for what an independent Sudan could achieve. So, uh, I want to ask you: uh, um, we're, as we get to independence and the decision to create an independent Sudan as it existed uh, 
uh, north and south prior to to 2011. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the connection between these two regions and knowing that the the south eventually secedes and is you know a, a big part of the uh, the story that that we should get to about the current state of the situation in Sudan um how well did these two regions kind of mesh together and did it make sense uh to create this uh you know single country out of these two places that's a great question i mean in many ways, the 19th century state, it was an expansionist state, right? It was a state in which cities like Khartoum were settled uh, with merchants, often foreign merchants, people that came from throughout the world. It was a very international 19th century city. But what was what were the merchant trades in which they were engaged in? Um, they were engaged in, you know, ivory, hunt, ivory uh, large game hunting, ostriches, they tr- ostrich feathers. They tried to do... Um, some gold mining, but one of the principal trades was the slave trade. And for that, they were continuously pushing uh, the frontier. They would send out uh, sub-merchants and they would create fortresses throughout the country further and further away from Khartoum. And the border between North Sudan and South Sudan is actually a swamp region called the Sud. Uh, And it's there, right, that many of these slaving fortresses existed. And so, in part, the relation of South Sudan uh, to North Sudan is a relationship built on the slave trade. So maybe, uh, Alden, would you mind talking a little bit more about these Sudanese nationalists, who they are, what is their ideology, uh, what do they believe in, and what type of state that they're trying to build? Because one thing that you emphasize in your book is a very clear distinction between sort of the Sudanese metropole and the Sudanese periphery and, and what is considered to be part of the state and what isn't. So who are these guys or ladies and where are they situated um, literally in the geography of Sudan? So a lot of uh, the Sudanese nationalists that will come to power, like in the most post-colonial states, many of them are either uh, teachers or lower bureaucrats or sometimes military, lower officers in the colonial apparatus. But one of the things that was really important in the creation of a Sudanese nationalism was a bilingualism. They, they spoke both English, but they also really emphasized Arabic literature. And in doing so, they kind of created a... a a unique identity for themselves. And the very word Sudan comes from Sudani the Blacks, uh, was a word that nationalists started using in the 1920s um, in order to deny the British claim to write down their uh, tribal identification. They were trying to say, we won't write down our tribal identification. We'll we'll instead, we'll call ourselves Sudani. Uh, And so, but they were very much tied to the... uh, to what's today at the University of Khartoum or Gordon's College at the time, the elite uh, high schools, uh, they called themselves the Graduate Caucus. And so they very much emphasized that they had at least a high school education. And they were very suspicious of what they saw as the provincial elites being created um, in Torrid and Rumbek and these cities in South Sudan um, and high schools in South Sudan or in the peripheral and places like Darfur, or the East, they were not, they were not very uh, accommodative of the idea that they would need to integrate uh, these other groups. They were also very dismissive of clan and, and ethnic chieftains, uh, of traditional elites who they thought the British used to undermine the power of um, the educated elite who had the right to rule. So how does Sudan eventually become independent? I believe you said in 1956. What is the process um, by which that happens? And what is what is the early sort of focus of the uh, post-colonial Sudan? What is the main economic engine of the state? What, what type of thing are they trying to do? How do they envision themselves within Africa itself? Where are they oriented? Is it north, south, east, west? Um, a big question, but I mean, just to give people who might not know anything about Sudan uh, some sort of orienting position. Yeah, so Sudan's independence, if you go to the uh, State Department archives, it's actually really fine to see where you find documents about Sudan and and U.S. foreign policy, like what what times the U.S. actually cares about Sudan. There's so many documents about uh, the run-up to Sudan's independence. It was a major issue because it was tied uh, to British negotiations to stay in Suez. 
Um, and so it's tied in this moment in the late 40s, early 50s, in which, you know, people like Jamal Abdel Nasser are rising to power. Egyptian nationalists are becoming more powerful. There's this broader question of whether or not Egypt will join an alliance, a military alliance with uh, Britain and the United States. And so just, um, Alden, at this time, who's governing what becomes Sudan? Is it still the Anglo-British or is it now just, yeah, um, it's, sorry, it's Anglo-Egypt? The, it's still the Anglo-Egyptian. Uh, okay, cool. Economy. Got it. Um, and... You know, I mean, King Farouk, the last king of Sudan, I, I usually use a, I usually show a watch, his Patik Philippe watch, and it, right, and it has a big picture and it shows you what he considers to be Sudan. I mean, considers to be Egypt and it includes, you know, Sudan, part of Libya. Uh, it's a huge territory. And the Egyptians are basically saying to the British, look, if you want to maintain good relationships with us, uh, you're going to need to give us or help facilitate the transfer of sovereignty of Sudan to us. Of course, the relationship between Nasser and the British doesn't go so well. And by 53, uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser actually surprises the British, and he comes out and says the Sudanese people should have a referendum to decide their own fate. And he fully suspects that the Sudanese will vote as brothers uh, to stay with Egypt. As brothers in Islam or as brothers in sort of Egyptian nation building? So he sees them as kind of Arab brothers or, uh, I mean, both in Islam, but also as Arab brothers. And he's looking at the Khartoum elite, right? Uh, the Arabized elite in Khartoum. Um, and he thinks that they will vote uh, to stay. And also the large Sufi orders. Uh, one of the most important Sufi orders, Khatmiya, um, which is really big in Eastern Sudan, but also into Eritrea, is really closely aligned with the Egyptians. Um, and so, you know, he thinks both the countryside and the cities will vote to stay. Um, in and that's what happened. And that's why Sudan is now part of Egypt. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Everybody lives happily ever after. <laughs> and actually, he's really lucky because his candidate actually wins and becomes prime minister, uh, Azhari. Um, and this is 53, you were saying? So he wins in 54. There's an election. And his goal is to prepare for this vote on self-determination. But this vote doesn't actually happen. Instead, in parliament, a year and a half later, Azhari declares that Sudan is independent. And this completely surprises the Egyptians, who actually thought that it was going to vote uh, to stay aligned with them. So I just have a question. So you, parliament, you're referring to the Sudanese parliament, which like they kind of have their own independent organization, but is effectively connected to Egypt, which it sounds like has more governing control of this uh, region than Britain in the mid-1950s. That seems to be the case. No. So Britain had actually a largely limited Egyptian control over Sudan. Uh, one of the British policies from the 1930s so Britain onwards control. Okay, got it. Uh, was to basically push out most Egyptian officials who had staffed, had any positions of influence in, um, in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. They were tr- trying to systematically limit Egyptian influence. But so but, Sudan uh, declares itself independent in 56. And how do the British and Egyptians respond to that? Happily, I'm sure. <laughs> the Egyptians are really annoyed. Uh, the Egyptians are really annoyed and actually quite worried. Because Sudan being you know further downstream on the Nile or upstream on the Nile, there's always this fear that someone could do something in in Sudan that would cut off the Nile waters to Egypt. And this is also a period, you know, 56 is also the year of the Suez War. And so there's this fear that Egypt is actually going to be encircled. And so you see a lot of concerns, you know, are the Israelis going to be in Sudan? Are, you know, are the British going to use Sudan as a rear base uh, from which to cut off Egypt? But this doesn't exactly happen, right? I mean, one of the reasons that Sudan votes uh, to be independent is that the large landlords in Sudan, who were largely also the religious leaders in the Sufi orders, they actually are worried that Nasser is going to force them, is going to undercut them with Egyptian cotton and force them to either grow food uh, for the Egyptian cities and to buy Egyptian manufactured goods instead of allowing them to sell their cotton for hard currency on the world market. And so that's actually why they decide to become independent. Uh, the large cotton growers in Sudan want to have the right to sell cotton independently. Um, and one of the major points of your book is that a, a lot of people who analyze uh, Sudan today 
sort of read back the wars of the 80s and the 90s into earlier periods and that this this period that you focus on in your book, the mid-century period, is often overlooked. So could you maybe just give a little précis of, of Sudanese politics in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s? And, and what is this country doing? You know, where is power located? What is it exporting? What is its role in the international arena? Because I, I imagine most listeners will have no sense of, of where Sudan stands in the, the so-called liberal international order. <laughs> <laughs> so today we see Sudan, or in the early 21st century, Sudan was a petrol state. But Sudan does not have petroleum uh, in the 1950s. Sudan is actually a cotton state. And cotton is both the promise for Sudan, but it's a huge burden for Sudan. Because they grew cotton at really high prices during World War II, when cotton was scarce. But by the time they get independent in 56, Actually, cotton is being dumped everywhere on the world market. And the Americans have forced Britain to stop doing its kind of sterling area protection and open itself up to American imports of cotton. Thank God. (laughs) And then the other problem that they have is that when the Sudanese go, so Sudan is actually very flexible, right? The Sudanese elite are looking for a patron. They thought the British would be happy that they declared independence from, from Egypt. And therefore, Britain would continue development aid. But Britain suddenly realizes, oh, actually, you're not a colony. Uh, We have no obligations to you. We're not even sure you can join the Commonwealth. You didn't really exist. They don't even want to pay the pensions for the colonial officials who served. I imagine that has to be racialized, right? The Commonwealth is basically uh, white dominant states, correct? Eventually, it'll include the African states, but Britain is trying Initially, to limit. Initially, though, yeah, 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 but it's trying to limit its liabilities. It's like we don't want to have anything to do with any of you guys. Right. Um, we always thought you were a burden colony with nothing much to produce. And then the Egyptians are like, "Well, we told you uh, you should probably stop growing cotton. You should grow food to feed our manufacturing cities, and we're also going to flood northern Sudan to build the Aswan Dam without considering your interests at all." And then they go to the Soviets. Oh, no, they go to the Americans. And the Americans are like, mm, we're interested uh, if you would design a defensive pact. Uh, we, you know, Khartoum Airport is actually a huge airport. It was built uh, during World War II. And, it, you know, it's a trance. It's a place where actually uh, supply planes had landed and trying to cross across Africa. Um, but the Americans aren't that interested. And it takes Sudanese politics as divided. Some Sudanese politicians are like, I don't know if we could sign a defensive pact, if, if Jamal Abdel Nasser and Arab solidarity, what would that mean in light of 56? Uh, what would that mean, you know, about Arab brotherhood, which is still a very popular idea at this time. And in the two years it takes them to try to figure this out, and just organize themselves too. They have to stand up the ministries. They have to figure out, you know, who's going to staff the foreign ministry, all these things. By 58, the Americans are like, mm, we're not really interested. And then when they go for development aid, the Americans are like, we could give you aid, but we can't because we don't want to have any more cotton produced. Uh, what would, you know, the congressmen and senators from South Carolina say if we're subsidizing cotton to compete with their cotton? And then the That's Soviet actually really interesting. Has anyone written about sort of Southern American politics and their relationship to Africa in terms of the economy? I had never heard that, but that's a really compelling you know, building off the Katz-Nelson argument about Southern um, politics. Sorry, just, that, no, that's no. a very interesting tangent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's a really interesting thing. The, the Southerners are basically like, we can't really give you any development assistance because we think it will go towards uh, this kind of expansion, even though this is what the World Bank is recommending. Got it, um, okay. And then the Soviets say something similar. They're like, we've expanded into Kazakhstan. We have our own cotton fields in Soviet Asia, Central Asia, and we're actually producing too much cotton. So we don't want to buy your cotton either. I think they offer them cheese from Czechoslovakia. They're like, you can give cotton to Czechoslovakia. We have a surplus of cheese. And the Sudanese are like, what are we going to do with all this cheese? Um, <laughs> and, so, and so is, is, is um, in terms of security thinking, do, do neither of the superpowers think that Sudan is important enough for security reasons, even though they have uh, Khartoum Airport is so big? Basically, they don't think it's important enough to, to do defensive alliances or things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, so largely the Sudanese find themselves a few years after independence, even though in the early 50s it had seemed really important and interesting to the Americans, to the British, to the Egyptians. By the late 50s, everyone is kind of like, mm, it's not that it's not strategically important. And the American alliance by this time is 
firmly grounded in uh, Ethiopia. The huge American base is outside of Asmara, uh, the capital of Eritrea. And so they have that part of the Red Sea already. And the Egyptians are doing what they're doing around Suez. But there's not that much interest in Sudan. And by the early 1960s, the Americans will formalize this in something called the Quarry Report on Africa, where they'll say, look, the problem is all the African countries are coming to us and they're saying, look, it's we're really strategically important, but this is just rent-seeking. We don't need most of these places. All we need is two or three countries, uh, Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. You know, it'd be great if we can get Egypt back, but then we don't need a place like Sudan. How does this affect Sudanese politics in the 60s and the 70s? What's going on there? The big thing in Sudanese politics, especially for the modern educated elite. So the big tension in Sudanese politics is you have a bunch of, not a bunch, but you have a an elite group of people, men and women, who've now received secondary education and are increasingly receiving college educations, some of whom have gone abroad to places like Oxford and, and Cambridge, some of whom have gone to the American University of Beirut, some of whom are going to Egyptian universities. And they see themselves as having the right to rule. And they call themselves modernizers. And their idea is that, you know, we need to take over the country and develop it. And what's holding us back are all these like rural people organized in Sufi orders. One of the great uh, Sudanese uh, Islamic modernists would come home from Paris and he would say all they're doing, Hassan al-Tarabi would come home from the Sorbonne. He has a degree from the Sorbonne, the University of London. You know, he thinks he's really fancy. And he would say all these like uh, Sufis in the countryside, all they do is go rah, 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 rah. All they do is make murmuring noises. And, you know, we have an anti-colonial project we need to develop. And they, are, they have nothing to do for it. And so Sudanese politics was really uh, divided between this tension between, you know, a kind of elite that sees itself as educated, whether or not they were Islamist, communist, or, you know, just sort of liberal, and a kind of mass of Sudanese people. And this elite basically doesn't think that the majority of Sudanese people should be involved in democratic politics. So you see all of them writing in their journals to each other. They're like, God, we have these elections. We have these elected officials. They come to the parliament. They're not clean. They don't know how to speak properly. They don't know how to do politics. And so you see a kind of urge, a repeated urge from different sides of the political spectrum to bring in the military. And so by 1959, they're like, Parliament is deadlocked. We can't decide if we're aligning with the British. We can't decide if we're aligning with the Egyptians. We want to sign a deal with the Americans, but we can't get it approved. They bring in the military. And by 1959, Sudan has its first experiment in military rule. Sudan will have three major experiments in military rule. 1959 to 1964, uh, 1969 to 1984, 1989 to 2019. And then we can talk about today where the military is still sort of in power, but sort of not in power. Uh, but this traditionally, basically the modernizing forces are the kind of, I guess in the US it would be like the coastal elites. They look at the countryside and they're like, well, we can't let these people run the country. So let's bring in the generals. And the generals, their, their goal, at least in uh, 59, what they say they're going to do is they're going to bring in planners. They're like, look, we got these guys, uh, we sort of trained them, and we're going to come up with a 10-year economic plan. And they don't want to industrialize. So it's not like Nkrumah in Ghana or something like that, where they're going to try to structurally transform the economy. Uh, they're, what, they, they're, what they're looking at is Australia. Australia really, looms really large in their mind. They're like, the Australians have figured out how to export commodities and make money. And they're like, what we're going to do is we're going to triple the size of our largest irrigated uh, agricultural scheme. And we're going to grow so much high quality cotton that even if we have to accept relatively low prices for it, uh, we believe we're the lowest cost cotton producers in the world and we'll still be able to make money and we'll be able to use our dominance of the international cotton market to develop the rest of the country. So... I wonder if we could talk as we kind of get to uh, Bashir and then uh, present day, if you could talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about these tensions between the sort of um, educated, urbanized elite, uh, which, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but tends to be northern, tends to be Arab speaking um, versus 
the Southern peoples, uh, and, you know, and the, the sort of hostilities that, that were a, a feature of uh, Sudanese politics throughout this period between North and South, um, you know, because of, in part because of decisions that were made, like, uh, you know, giving a lot of positions in the new government to Northerners and making the official language Arabic, which left, you know, Southern uh, politicians kind of unable to participate in some sense uh, in national politics and, and eventually spreading uh, to also include uh, the non-Arab peoples in, in Darfur and how these kind of tensions uh, sort of defined uh, the course of Sudanese history in this period. And then if you could give people um, some basic understanding of, of who uh, Omar al-Bashir was and, and his takeover uh, that, that will give us, I think, the, the background for, for what's happen, happening now. Yeah, no, I mean, the question of racial identity in Sudan is really is really fraught. But at its core, there are like three main groups that we could think of. They're what they call the Riverine Arabs or Awilad al-Bahr, which means the children of the river, basically the children of the Nile River. And these, in these communities, uh, whether or not they have been Nuba from the sort of north near the border with, with Egypt or, you know, uh, Arab groups along, like the Shagia, the Jahlin, they would become the core of the Sudanese state. And they were the closest and most aligned uh, to the colonial project. They often suffered at the hands of the colonial project, but they would become uh, the, what they call the Jalaba, or the merchants. They were the ones who go out and they pull back to the core. So that was their traditional, traditional meaning, that they would go further and further afield and like they truck and barter, they would pull both enslaved people and goods back to the core. And this is how Khartoum grows, right? Both as a 19th century city, later as a colonial city. And these dynamics remain into the post-colonial period. And layered on top of them is a new class of what we might call the Effendi, uh, the educated elites. And here, the educated elites were often associated with the military, but the colonial project did something very interesting. It, it created in the 1920s what they call closed districts. And so to address the hostilities of the 19th century, they basically said the Awilad al-Bahr would not be allowed to enter as merchants, proselytizers, or frequently as military forces into the closed districts of southern Kordofan, uh, most of South Sudan, large parts of Darfur, and some parts of Eastern Sudan. And this would become a major issue for nationalist movements in, um, in Khartoum. They saw their inability to enter and to proselytize, to trade, or you know, to serve as officers or colonial officials as one of the main impediments uh, to them as a, as a kind of corporate class. But at the same time, the British were training another group of people in South Sudan uh, to also serve as colonial administrators. The South Sudanese colonial administration was perhaps not as big as the one in Northern Sudan, but the outbreak in 54, the first uprising, which many people see to start uh, the Torrent Rebellion, which many people see as the start of the Civil War, which happened even before independence. Um, it's it's both South Sudanese officers and educated officials who basic who are uprising, um, and and they are not taught Arabic. Right in South Sudan, Arabic is removed uh, from the educational system, and South Sudanese elites were encouraged if they were going to go on to higher education to go into other parts of British East Africa. And so there's a creation of two separate elites from very, very early on. Um, and that's only thinking about elites, right? This is only thinking about the people who would actually sit in the parliament. And so when Azhari goes to Juba, um, he goes to Juba, I think, in 54 or 53 or 54, because he knows he's going to become prime minister. He, he supposedly says he's never met any of these people before. They organize a huge meeting for him of Southern Sudanese, uh, you know, the major personalities. And it's unclear exactly why he leaves, but he leaves kind of in a hurry. 
And there's a sense that these are two communities of, of elites that actually have almost no uh, interaction with one another. Their interactions have been mediated actually by the colonial, by the British colonial officials. And so they have a deep distrust. And then the Northern elites do something very stupid um, in terms of creating a national bureaucracy. They say they will refuse to waive the Arabic exam for South Sudanese graduates. And so you're not talking about the mass of South Sudanese people, right? You're talking about the people who were specifically trained to work in the colonial administration, they're systematically excluded from uh, any presence in the colonial administration in the post-colonial state. And when you add to that a newfound contempt for uh, the traditional authorities and the major uh, tribal confederations and this idea of backwardness, right? One of the hallmarks of, of sort of Northern thinking was not only racial animosity, which was core to their project, right? I mean, you read the officials when they try to recruit Northerners to go manage projects in South Sudan, and there's all sort no one wants to take any jobs in South Sudan, uh, to work as clerks, to work as accountants. They have to bring in people from South Asia to do it. And there's this great fear, right? Uh, it's very hard to get Northerners to go to what they see to be hostile territory, and they have all sorts of racial and ethnic fears about what will happen to them in these places. And they also have this idea of backwardness, right? You see it in the Egyptian writing. You see it, in, to a certain extent, in the British writing. And you see it definitely in the Northern Sudanese writing. So, like, these people don't know how to do agriculture. The British famously said that they have all these cattle, but they can't possibly be selling these cattle for money. Um, and then these ideas get picked up in the 10-year plan. This idea, they call it non-economic cattle. But you're like, if somebody has 10,000 heads of cattle, they clearly are doing something with these cattle uh, that's profitable. And so, but, you know, it would be not read as even wealth, right? These are like customary behaviors. Uh, we need to teach them. Um, similarly, when they would go into Darfur, the Darfurian issue is actually slightly different. Darfur is an independent state until 1916. And there's a memory of the late 19th century when forces came from Darfur, particularly the Bagar, uh, and they came east and they actually conquered the center. And so there's also this rivalry with Darfur that complicates, uh, that complicates the issue. But there's also a racial superiority, right? I mean, people are like, you know, these are backwards people, uh, these are Africans, but also people of the West are seen as threatening. And, you know, there's a memory of them having conquered the state. So uh, let's, uh, we should, I guess, move a little bit closer to present day. Can we, can you talk a little bit about the 1989 coup? Uh, you've also, you already mentioned Hassan Tarabi, who's one of the, the figures involved, but, um, you know, talk about what happened with that takeover and, and why was Bashir, I mean, you, as you said, there have been, there were other experiments in military rule in, in Sudanese history, but um, why was Bashir able to last for 30 years where the previous military governments didn't, didn't get, you know, nearly that, that long. One of the things I think that was really interesting about the Bashir experiment is actually the partnership between Hassan al-Tarabi, who was a university professor, a uh, professor of law at the university of Khartoum and also an ideologue. But uh, what he had done is he used the university of Khartoum to build out the core of a new Islamist organization. I mean, it was the Egypt, first it starts as the Sudanese chapter of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, but by the 1970s, it's become independent and it's sort of its own organization. But he, he, he manipulates student politics in order to dominate the kind of educated elite. And Omar al-Bashir, who had been an officer in the previous military dictatorship, I mean, a lower level officer, an intelligence officer, and some people say that he, when the previous military dictatorship, one of the first things he did is he took the files, the personnel files. Uh, he took copies of the personnel files with him as he left his post. And he had those copies of the personnel files privately. And he was able to use those copies of the personnel files to find ideologically correct officers and place them into power as the civilians came to power for four years. 
Um, and therefore, by 1989, he had a cadre of ideologically uh, motivated officers and he was and he had the most successful partnership between the military and an ideological party and in 1989 oh, um sorry. alden could you just briefly explain what's the ideology what oh, do they sorry. believe what do they want so in sudan amongst the educated classes or the university of khartoum the two main ideological currents were the sudanese communist party and the muslim brotherhood and some people said they kind of mirrored each other the Communist Party, by some accounts, was the largest communist party in Africa in the 1960s. Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood would actually be the only Muslim Brotherhood organization to ever successfully capture the state. And so, you know, these were two really important ideological trends. Um, but the Muslim Brotherhood in Sudan believed in, I guess, what we might consider a type of Islamism, the idea. And they and they had many different rivals in um in Islamic politics, who they defeated. Uh, one is the Republican brothers, who we can come to later, who will play a role in the kind of present transition. But the argument between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Republican brothers was whether or not you could use the state to Islamize society, or whether or not you could only uh, capture this, create an Islamic state if you had already, if you created an Islamic society first. And Hassan al-Tarabi was a core believer that a vanguard could capture the state and capture the military, and from those positions of influence could Islamize society. Is he reading Lenin? Are, are these people who are reading Lenin, or is this just you know in the, in the maelstrom of decolonial politics of the middle of the ni- uh, 20th century? Yeah, I think they all read Lenin. They all... Uh, yeah, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in general, I mean, was yeah, influenced yeah, yeah. heavily by Leninism, yeah. And I mean, this is a guy who also, when he returns and uh, makes his big public appearance in the mid-1960s. He dresses up like Robespierre. I mean, so oh. these guys, you know, are thinking... <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> are, are heavily, like, you know, are heavily influenced by Western uh, political philosophy. Uh, and they're masters of the canon, right? I mean, Hassan al-Trabi spoke French fluently. He spoke English fluently. He was a great... Uh, he had a great knowledge of Islamic thought. Uh, many people said he could have, he would have been a great philosophy professor, you know, in a place like Canada. But instead, he basically performs a coup against his brother-in-law, uh, who's from another big family, and dominates the state, you know, on and off for for thirty years. But he will be replaced, right? So he he makes the classic problem. I mean, he has the kind of classic Trotsky problem, right? He thinks that ideas are what really matters, and after ten years in power. Omar al-Bashir informs him that his services are no longer needed um, <laughs> and he is uh, put under house arrest. But, you know, but in the beginning, I think part of what made uh, this uh, military project so powerful was that it wasn't only the generals ruling. They were ruling with an ideological party that that saw itself, the Islamic Front, or the some people call it the Islamic Movement. It tried to deny that it was... Uh, one entity, but it would later formulate itself into the, the National Islamic Front. Um, and they had their own Shura Council, an Islamic Council of Governance. And Tarabi has this idea that he's going to use Sudan. He's not that ple- I mean, he's a classic kind of like, you know, Marxist problem. He's like, well, I came to power in a backwards country. It's not, you know, it's not Egypt. It's not Cairo. Mm, but he's like, I can use Sudan as a base to formulate an international Islamic revolution. And so he starts inviting everyone to come to Sudan. Uh, this is why Osama bin Laden would be there in sort of the mid nineties. This is why like, what's his name? Carlos Jackal is there, but Islamic leaders from throughout the world, anybody who's anti-colonial or Islam, you know, Islamically motivated is basically invited to show up. And they're like, we're going to make Khartoum a capital. This gets out of hand when someone a foe associated sort of, Tarabi says he didn't know about it, but someone associated with the Islamic movement helps Egyptian jihad organize an assassination attempt on Hosni Mubarak in Addis Ababa. And at, from that moment, sort of in the mid-90s, uh, Omar al-Bashir is kind of like, wow, guys, you didn't even, you know, these things are getting crazy. You basically just tried to assassinate <laughs> like not the cool. Leader. You changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you tried to assassinate Fake the leader. Fake friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you used the country to organize, you know, uh, attacks on East Africa, uh, American interests in East Africa. 
Lord Bashir is like, you know, guys, we're planning on surviving. <laughs> and, and so there's this tension starts to build, but it takes a while. It takes still another like four or five years uh, for Bashir to win and if for it to become a more traditional uh, military dictatorship. Can we, uh, one, one other, I think, stop we need to make on the way to talking about what's happening right now is, is in the 2011 uh, secession declaration of independence or, or, you know, formation of South Sudan. Um, I, without going into all the, the kind of things that went into that event the 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 conflict and and the the sort of uh uh you know what was happening kind of underlying that uh can you talk a little bit about the impact that carving out south sudan had on what is now sudan was left of sudan you mentioned earlier that uh sudan eventually became a petro state it you know from, went from cotton to petrol uh or pet to, to oil it, it's not really that much of a petro state anymore south sudan was where a lot of that oil was so so can you talk a little bit about how big an impact that had on the the remaining sudanese state mm. i guess first i guess i would say the other major figure in sort of the 80s, 90s in Sudan is John Garang. Uh, and John Garang is the leader of the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement Army. And he, like Hassan al-Tarabi in many ways, he's slightly different in that he combines both military leadership and ideological leadership in, you know, in sort of one person. But, you know, he goes from being a Marxist to less of a Marxist over time. But, but his core is this idea of the new Sudan a Sudan of all of its peoples that will be uh, a multiracial, multi-ethnic Sudan uh, and a secular Sudan. Today, that lives on, I think, in the idea of a Sudan governed by the peoples of the peripheries. Even this concept of a united peripheries kind of comes from Hassan, I mean, from John Garang. And why I bring him up is that I think Hassan al-Turabi and John Garang both, for better or worse, have ideas for the whole country of Sudan. And they see, you know, a project either to Islamize Sudan or to create a secular Sudan. But when they talk about it, even in, as they fight the civil war, one of the most vicious civil wars in Africa in the 1990s, they're competing for the whole of the country. Um, I think when Hassan al-Tarabi is pushed aside, Omar al-Bashir, not because he was less uh prejudiced or had you know higher held uh South Sudanese people in higher esteem takes a slightly different position. Uh, Omar al Bashir, like Salva Kiir, who would eventually come uh to run the SPLA and South Sudan, both are military men through and through. Uh, many people say they actually knew each other as they fought in Baragazal. They were both intelligence officers, they had sort of parallel positions. Uh, but both of them take a kind of pessimistic view of Sudan. They're like, we can't really defeat one another. And we can't live together. And we're two different people. And I think their rise um, sort of facilitates the peace agreement in 2005. John Goring mysteriously dies shortly after the signing of the peace agreement in an airplane crash, um, which allows Salva Kiir to consolidate power. And Omar Bashir by then has sidelined Hassan al Um Their rise facilitates a kind of idea of partition. And it's, many people suspect they had kind of agreed privately that they were going to split the country, even though the peace agreement said that, you know, we should be working towards unity and all these things. Uh, today, after a brief conflict in 2013, Actually, South Sudanese troops actually guard many of the oil fields in South Sudan. Uh, you know, there's clear cooperation between uh, the Sudanese military and the South Sudanese military. And so it's, a, it's an interesting partition because it actually split power amongst two uh, military leaders who perhaps had more in common with each other than they had with anyone else. Um, but you're right, it changed the very nature of Sudan. It meant that the idea of a kind of large Sudan that was going to be multi-ethnic and incorporate all of these types of people was, was, was limited. Though what John Garang had always said was actually true, 
just South Sudanese partition wouldn't solve the kind of Arab-African problems, right? Sudan, even in the North, uh, includes tons of South Sudanese people and includes different own African populations throughout the country. Arabs in Sudan are not one monolithic group. So if you ask the Arab, the Rizi Gata, the Arabs from Darfur, they're not seen as the same as Bahar, uh, as the Awilad al-Bahar or the Arabs of the Riverine. They don't recognize each other as like necessarily one uh, united group. And so it didn't actually solve the multi-ethnic problems of either Sudan or South Sudan. South Sudan, as we've seen, has been torn in its own kind of civil conflict, which continued, uh, you know, shortly after partition. And Sudan itself is still torn in its own kind of center-periphery dynamics. And so, in some ways, it simplified things, but it didn't really resolve any of the problems. So, I think, I mean, we're getting uh, up to a point where we should should start to wrap up. So, why don't we talk about the forces that coalesced uh, in 2019 to remove Omar al-Bashir that then reached a peace deal with a lot of these, you know, almost all, with a couple of exceptions of these peripheral uh, rebel factions that that had been resisting uh, Bashir's state. And, you know, uh, maybe you could give people, give us a sense of the extent to which uh, the military has actually, or I mean, you know, knowing now, you know, knowing what we know now after the events of this week, uh, the extent to which the military um, ever really ceded any kind of authority to uh, civilian oversight, because it, it really seems like um, they they didn't at this point. Although for a, for a while there, it seemed like there was a an actual shot at a transition back to civilian rule. No, that's a great question. I mean, so in 2019, Sudan was rocked by historic and huge protests. And I think one of the things that has changed, and I don't, and I think this will change no matter what happens in the outcome of the current last week's events, um, is that Sudan today, if in 1956, there was only a small educated group, uh, you know, mostly located in, in Omdurman and Khartoum, in Khartoum North, in the capital cities, uh, today it's much bigger, right? Education access has been greatly expanded. You know, some of the leaders of the recent protest movement in 2019 came from what used to be seen as uh, provincial capitals like El Obayed. Darfur has cities of millions of people. And so I think what happened in 2019 is that previous protest movements had been easy to suppress because they were from a kind of smaller middle class. But in 2019, uh, the protest movements were gained by also the provincial uh, middle class. All these provincial cities also participated. And one of the big chants uh, was Kulana Darfur. All of us are Darfur. And the idea was that, you know, the counterinsurgency that was fought in Darfur, well, maybe it wasn't like that in Khartoum in the capital, But, you know, we've all been under this kind of state oppression or victimized by the security services. And so there's a kind of rising national consciousness that I think took the uh, military by surprise. And also the growth and power of the militias, both the pro-regime militias, uh, like the rapid support forces, but also, you know, militias like the SLA, the Sudanese Liberation Army, uh, the Sudanese Revolutionary Front, uh, SPLM North, uh, the Beja, all of these groups, I think, uh, complicated the security scene for the military. And the military, without the oil revenues that you know it lost to South Sudan, had been making up for its revenues by selling mercenaries, selling its services to the Gulf states. Um, and also it had allowed militias to sell their services to the Gulf states, particularly for their war in Yemen and also the wars in Libya. Um, and so these things were creating a dynamic inside the country uh, that made it harder and harder to govern. And Omar al-Bashir, while he was a really wily leader, you know, a balancer, uh, he was great at raising revenue. In 2019, I think he found himself sort of uh, out of maneuvers. The Americans, while we were normalizing with them, 
we were probably never going to fully normalize with Omar al-Bashir in power because, you know, he's remembered as the butcher of Darfur, the butcher of South Sudan, a war criminal indicted by the International Criminal Court. Um, and I think some senior officers in the military and security services thought to themselves, look, we could go down as war criminals ourselves, murdering, uh, you know, tens of thousands of civilians in the streets in broad daylight, or maybe it's time to let Omar Bashir go and perhaps reach some kind of accommodation um, and pursue this project of normalization uh, with the United States uh, and the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And I think that was the context for the initial uh, power sharing agreement in 2019. One of its biggest foreign policy outcomes, of course, was a normalization with Israel, uh, which was brokered, you know, by the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia uh, with the Trump administration. And, and that allowed, you know, the last of the sanctions to be lifted off of, uh, off of Sudan, its removal from the uh, state sponsors of terrorism list. The, the uh, hoped for reincorporation of Sudan into the international financial system. And even more importantly, Sudan is now able to receive um, funding and loans uh, from the World Bank and IMF. And so the Sudanese military, I think, was always interested in this project of rehabilitation. And they knew to do that, they needed technocrats. They needed people who had uh, respectability. Uh, one of whom, of course, was Abdullah Hamdouk, who was an international economist who had served, you know, in the Economic Commission for Africa and a number of international organizations before. But to do that, they also needed to quiet the streets. Um, and in the process of the protest, in the process of destroying what was called the National Congress Party, which was Bashir's vehicle, Bashir actually kind of like, like Gaddafi, the way it organized at the local level was it would have neighborhood committees uh, where, you know, there would be like a local boss pick in each neighborhood, maybe a mechanic, maybe an imam, maybe a teacher. And that boss would sort of organize at the very local level interface with the state. And once that broke down with the breakdown of the party, in its place were formed neighborhood resistance committees. And these resistance committees uh, or who comes out to the streets even now. And they, they were able to barricade the streets, to close off neighborhoods, uh, to strike in crucial sectors. So we see that all the doctors will go on strike in the strike syndicate. Right now, the oil workers are striking. Uh, I never thought about central bankers as being somebody to go on strike, but it would be like if our Federal Reserve <laughs> went on strike, uh, they would announce a, a strike. Odd, yes. But it would be devastating, right? Can you imagine yeah, if the Federal sure, Reserve absolutely. was like, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> we're not going right. to process any papers or use the computers. Uh, so they're on strike. Uh, the telecommunications workers, but, you know, so so the army finds itself in a very strong position, but it also finds itself dealing with these kind of national strikes, neighborhood resistance committees, uh, and some of the older parties. And so I think that's partially why the army is engaging in these kind of transitional measures. Right now, the crisis has occurred because they signed a three-year transitional agreement. For the first two years, uh, the senior commander and the Sudanese armed forces would get to be uh, the head of something called the Sovereign Council. And it's unclear what the, exactly the Sovereign Council is supposed to be doing, but it's supposed to represent the state. Mm. And below it is a technocratic government of ministers who are supposed to be non-political uh, and who have agreed supposedly to not run in the elections that are supposed to be held in another year. But as part of this agreement, after the first two years, uh, the military was supposed to hand over chairmanship of the sovereign council to a civilian. And in, in a few uh, a few weeks ago, over the last few weeks, there have been a number of tensions. How would this go on? The military was saying, uh, the civilians are not competent to run the election, that they're too political, uh, that the parties will steal the election instead of opening it up and making it truly accountable. And then the political parties have been saying that the military needs to uh, submit itself uh, 
to transparency, to inspection, to justice, particularly for massacres that have occurred in places like Darfur, but also during the uh, 2019 protest movement, uh, particularly the June 3rd massacre where they killed civilians in Khartoum and dropped bodies into the Nile. Uh, the military says it wasn't us, but I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> they're claiming there's a, there needs to be not many <laughs> other suspects, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so these, oh, and whether or not Bashir will face trial uh, is another big issue. Uh, whether or not Bashir will go to The Hague to face trial. The military is like, we can put him on trial. We can just put him on trial here in Sudan. But there's a fear that if Bashir goes on trial, that he'll start saying, you know, I wasn't alone when I made these decisions in Darfur. Right, and he'll rat everybody out, yeah. He'll rat everybody out. Um, oh, and there's a question of corruption. Uh, were assets transferred to companies related to the security services and the military during the 30 years of the Bashir rule? And of course, assets were transferred. Uh, the question, I guess, is what to do about it. You know, what, what, uh, was this corruption? Was this, you know, a state development strategy that's legitimate? Sudan became much more self-reliant during the Bashir period, but, but, you know, only people who aligned themselves with the Islamist movement or the military were allowed to participate. And so all of these questions are standing, at, came to a head with the symbolic transfer of power from a military person to a civilian. Um, and the military now says it will, of course, hold elections. It just uh, wants to reorganize the political parties. It says it's going to create councils of the youth uh, to represent uh, that sounds good to me. I don't see a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, how could you argue with that? <laughs> and so, you know, these uh, these tensions, I think, are at the forefront of what the street battles in Khartoum are about right now. Well, that's great. Uh, Alden, yeah, I, I think we'll probably uh, have to call it now. Uh, we'd love to have you back as things yeah, develop so with much, Sudanese I mean, there's so politics. There's so much more to get yeah. into on top of uh, what we've already done. Yeah. Now. We should say to people, the, the book, your book is Transforming Sudan, Decolonization, Economic Development and State Formation. We'll have a link to that in the show description if people want to check it out. All right. Thanks again. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Alden. Yeah, 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 yeah.